Listen to a conversation between a student and his professor. Good afternoon, Professor Johnson. Um, one of the students in the class said that you wanted to speak with me. Hi, George. I'm glad you could stop by. No problem at all. How was your conference this past weekend? Oh, it went well. I presented Saturday afternoon, but that was all I had to do. Was there a good turnout? It was about average. You know, weekend panels aren't always the most popular. Anyhow, you're looking for a part-time job, aren't you? Uh, not at this time. Is there an opening in the department? Well, an environmental organization I support is looking for students to help with a a public awareness campaign about the dangers of pesticides. As you know, the community around this university has many farms, so the campaign's aim is to target the local people. And given the concern you showed about the environment, not to mention you're a biology major, I think this job would be perfect for you. Well, it sounds great, but I just started a new job last week. Really? Where? I'm working at a cafe near the campus as a waiter. I know it doesn't sound like much, but I really enjoy the social aspect of it. I get to talk with many different people each day. Well, I'm glad that you found a job, but um, as I mentioned in class, pesticide use is a real issue. Yes, I agree. It's a very serious issue. Um, what would my role be if I accepted the position? From my understanding, you'd be a researcher and trainer. Okay. What exactly would I have to do? Well, you'd be responsible for doing research on the effects of pesticides on the local farms. In particular, the levels of toxicity in the soil and water on the farms. These would need to be measured. Oh, and conducting simple trainings to help the farmers understand the dangers of using pesticides. A biology major would be especially knowledgeable about these effects and would be able to explain them to the farmers. Plus, the position definitely involves a lot of social interaction, so I'm sure you'd enjoy it. It sounds like something right up my alley, and it would certainly be more relevant. Um, I don't actually know very much about the use of pesticides on these farms. Do you remember that discussion in class about how pesticides are applied? I remember spray drift, right? When farmers apply pesticides to their fields, the droplets are often carried by the wind to other areas. The chemicals end up coating natural vegetation and contaminating rivers and lakes. That's part of it. Another issue is runoff. When pesticides are applied to fields, they're washed away when it rains, and the chemicals either dissolve into the water or bond with soil particles that are eroded by the rain. The end result of both processes is the pesticides end up where they don't belong. So we eat pesticides as well as drink them. That's what it amounts to. I'm pretty shocked people haven't done something about this. It's the reason why I'm pushing for this campaign. Oh, there's one more problem. Even if the pesticides remain in the sprayed area, eventually they will leach into the soil. You mean be absorbed into the soil? That's right. And once this happens, it's only a matter of time until the chemicals enter the groundwater, and this will cause all sorts of problems. So how about it? Would you like to take the job? Professor, you know how interested I am in the topic, but since I just got my present job, I'll need to think about it, and I'll have to ask the cafe manager about the situation. Can I get back to you tomorrow? I totally understand. I'll wait to hear from you. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. One, why does the professor ask to see the student?
Three. According to the professor, what is a consequence of both spray drift and runoff? Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. I'm working at a cafe near the campus as a waiter. I know it doesn't sound like much, but I really enjoy the social aspect of it. I get to talk with many different people each day. Well, I'm glad that you found a job, but um, as I mentioned in class, pesticide use is a real issue. Four. Why does the professor say this? Pesticide use is a real issue. Five. What is the professor's opinion about pesticides? Test 1. Part 1. Passage 2. Listen to part of a lecture in a physics class. In 1687, Isaac Newton published a work that has had a major impact on our understanding of the world, the universe even. It contained his three laws of motion. Um, we've already covered the first two laws in detail, so this morning I want to introduce the third law, which is what happens when force is exerted on an object. So, what exactly does Newton's third law of motion say? Well, it states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Now, I'm sure most of you have heard this before, but have you ever really considered what it means? In a nutshell, Newton believed that when two objects interact, they exert exactly the same amount of force on each other, just in opposite directions. Okay, I can see some confused looks out there. Let's try this. Many of you have probably played baseball, or at least watched a game. When a player hits the ball with the bat, force is being applied to the ball, right? But it may surprise you to learn that the bat is being subjected to the exact same amount of force from the ball. This is what is known as an action-reaction force pair. In essence, Newton said that force can never be applied in isolation. It always involves two objects exerting equal amounts of force on each other. Of course, this leads to the obvious question. How can one object move another? I mean, if both apply the same force to each other, there shouldn't be any motion at all, right? Um, that's actually a common misconception. That the equal and opposing actions somehow cancel each other out. However, what you need to realize is that the objects involved in an action-reaction force pair usually have different physical characteristics. Size, shape, mass. You get the idea. This means that they do not respond in the same way to the force involved in the interaction. For instance, the baseball and bat I mentioned earlier are clearly very different. Therefore, they respond differently to the same amount of force. The ball goes flying out into the field while the swing of the bat is slowed slightly. Okay, 
So far, we've been talking about what happens when objects actually make contact with each other. But Newton also studied force interactions in which, well, in which objects do not make physical contact. This led to the development of his theory of gravity. It is a well-known story. He was supposedly resting in an orchard when an apple fell on his head. In a moment of inspiration, he came up with the concept of gravity. Um, there might be elements of truth to this tale, but、uh, but I doubt that the process was that simple. Anyway, he argued that all objects in the universe attract one another through something called a gravitational force, and of course, the third law of motion applies to this type of interaction as well. Um, take Earth and the Moon. They are part of an action-reaction force pair, even though they have no direct contact with each other. So then, how does this indirect force influence them? Well, in the case of the moon, the gravitational force is strong enough to cause it to orbit the Earth. It cannot follow an independent path through the solar system, and must circle our planet instead. Um, even though the moon is moving rapidly, it doesn't go flying off into space. And of course, Earth is affected by this gravitational force as well. Though on a smaller scale because of its greater size and mass. Now Newton's theory of gravity was groundbreaking, and it was applied to the solar system for many years. But I should probably point out that when it comes to the gravitational interactions between stars, moons, and planets,、um, astronomers now turn to Albert Einstein's more recent theory of relativity. But that's for another lecture. Anyway, despite being written over 300 years ago. Newton's mathematical principles of natural philosophy contain many ideas that are still valid today. For example, his theory of gravity is used to calculate the effects of Earth's gravity and to plot the orbits of satellites. The concepts in the Newton's book also helped explain why rockets function. There is a widely held belief that a rocket accelerates because the burning gases it ejects sort of、um, push against the ground or the molecules in the air behind it. But if you think about it, this doesn't make sense. How would rockets be able to produce thrust in space then? I mean, there is no air or ground to push against there. In fact, rockets move because of the interaction between the rocket itself and the gas molecules it produces by burning fuel. They form an action-reaction force pair. You see, when a rocket's fuel is ignited, it converts into a gas and expands. But the ignition chamber has only one exit. Through the nozzle at the end of the rocket, so in effect, the rocket is pushing the pressurized gas out behind it, applying a lot of force in the process. And according to Newton's third law, this means that the gas molecules are pushing against the rocket with equal force in the opposite direction. This is what creates the thrust that moves the rocket. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. Six. What is the lecture mainly about? Seven. Why do the objects involved in an action-reaction force pair behave differently from each other? Eight. What is the professor's opinion of the story about Newton and the apple?
Nine. Why does the professor discuss Earth and the Moon? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. Now, Newton's theory of gravity was groundbreaking, and it was applied to the solar system for many years. But I should probably point out that when it comes to the gravitational interactions between stars, moons, and planets,、um, astronomers now turn to Albert Einstein's more recent theory of relativity. Ten. What does the professor imply when he says this?、Um, Astronomers now turn to Albert Einstein's more recent theory of relativity. Eleven. According to the professor, how does a rocket generate thrust? Test one, part one, passage three. Listen to part of a talk in a biology class. I'm pretty sure you know that animals are capable of camouflaging themselves so that they escape detection. You can probably name a few right off the bat. Susan. The chameleon changes colors, and a lot of other animals can take on the color of their surroundings. Good, but is that all? Or you know, their natural coloring allows them to blend in. Like deer and many kinds of insects, and some animals actually look like other objects or even other animals. Okay, that last one you mentioned is what I'm interested in: animals that mimic. Yeah, like the dead leaf butterfly. When its wings are folded up, they look exactly like dead leaves. That's certainly one example, but some animals go further, and one in particular is the true master of disguise. I'm talking about the octopus. Most species of octopus can alter their color, shape, size, and in some cases, even the、uh, texture of their skin. Today, I want to talk about the biological mechanisms that allow them to do this. When it comes to changing color, the octopus can choose from an almost unlimited palette of shades and hues, and can switch colors incredibly quickly, literally in the blink of an eye. It blends into the background so perfectly that it would take a deliberate search to find it. So how is this possible? Octopuses possess special skin cells called、um, chromatophores. These are pigment-containing or light-reflecting cells. They're commonly found in amphibians, fish, reptiles, and cephalopods. The classifications to which all species of octopus belong. Now, while these types of cells are fairly common in the animal kingdom, those found in the skin of an octopus are unique. They're structured in such a way that the octopus can move the pigment around. The process is called physiological color change, and an octopus simply uses its muscles to achieve this. Each chromatophore cell contains three malleable compartments. By squeezing or expanding each compartment, an octopus can change the color displayed by the cell, even allowing millions of subtle combinations. 
And since all cells are controlled separately, they can create remarkably clear and detailed displays. The effect is further enhanced by the presence of a reflective coating under each of the cells. So, changing color is one thing. I mean, lots of other animals can do this too. The chameleon, for one, as Susan mentioned. The octopus just does it better. However, octopuses can also radically transform not only their shape, but their size as well. Sounds like something from a science fiction movie, right? It's true, though. Just imagine. An octopus with an arm span of 30 centimeters, that's about a foot long, is able to reduce its proportions and squeeze through a hole less than a quarter of the size of their normal body shape. One octopus in captivity was even able to force himself into a mayonnaise jar. Now, in order to understand how an octopus is able to do this, you need to first know a little about its physical structure. Hmm, this may be a bit of a review for some of you, but, uh, well, bear with me. The octopus's eight arms don't actually have any tentacles. These arms are referred to as um, muscular hydrostats by biologists, um, mainly because their strength and rigidity is achieved solely through the compression of muscles. This is because the body of the octopus is composed almost entirely of soft tissue. It doesn't have an internal skeleton. There is no protective shell, nor does it have any cartilage. In fact, the only hard part of an octopus is its beak which resembles a parrot's beak and functions in much the same way. One particular species of octopus, the mimic octopus, is able to use this shape-shifting ability to imitate other species. It can mimic uh, 17 different species found in its habitat. As most of these are poisonous, this proves to be a great defense strategy for the octopus. Does anyone know what some of these poisonous species are? I've read that it can flatten itself to look like the poisonous soul or even use its arms to mimic a lionfish, which um, has venomous fins. Right, and you can be sure predators will go out of their way to avoid them, and their skin texture as well. Normally, the skin of an octopus is very smooth. This could prove to be a disadvantage if it was trying to blend in with uh, a piece of coral with a very rough surface. However, by distending small sections of its skin and using color shading to enhance the effect, the octopus can make the texture of its skin resemble almost anything. In some cases, even plants. I've seen pictures of these octopuses mimicking various things, um, like sea snakes and even rocks. But I'm really interested in that ink jet I read about. Octopuses can create an ink cloud to hide themselves. Yes, it's pretty amazing, the arsenal of weapons an octopus has. It's sort of like a last resort when a predator identifies the octopus and gives chase. The octopus releases ink in a cloud, sometimes even shooting a stream of it into the face of the predator. And this is what makes the octopus a true escape artist. That ink contains a substance that affects the olfactory organs of a predator so that it can't use its sense of smell to locate the escaping octopus. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. 12. What is the main topic of this lecture? Thirteen. According to the professor, why are the chromatophores of the octopus unique? Fourteen. What can be inferred about the mimic octopus?
15. Why does the professor mention the octopus's arsenal of weapons? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. However, octopuses can also radically transform not only their shape, but their size as well. Sounds like something from a science fiction movie, right? It's true, though. 16. Why does the professor say this? Sounds like something from a science fiction movie, right? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. Now, in order to understand how an octopus is able to do this, you need to first know a little about its physical structure. Hmm, this may be a bit of a review for some of you, but, well, bear with me. 17. Why does the professor say this? Well, bear with me.